I wanted to put a video together that I believe may help some people with big cam motors concerning Jacob brake application, particularly, particularly about why it matters to have a dual entry turbo versus a single entry turbo. I won't be going over the theory of operation on engine brakes or turbochargers, but rather the importance of models, part numbers, and application. There are videos of adjusting valves, injectors, and engine brakes, and I don't think YouTube needs another. The motor being worked on today is a Big Cam 3 NTC 400. The exhaust is being updated to a newer style pulse exhaust manifold. The original, part number 3801322 exhaust manifold, used ceiling rings between the end and center sections. Through the years, the ceiling rings commonly failed due to repeated heat exposure cycles. When the ceiling rings fail, exhaust leaks become present. The new 3801915 exhaust system was designed to replace the original style manifold in order to offer a longer lasting manifold. It's a machine slip fit connection between end and center sections. No ceiling rings are used with the new system. It is also equipped with an HT3B dual entry turbo. I am installing rebuilt injectors as ours was shot and reassembling the valve train and installing a 401B Jacobs heads in this video. So let's dive in and talk about turbos and Jacobs brakes. It is important to note that Cummins did make HT3B turbos as a single entry turbo. The physical difference in a single entry turbo and a dual entry turbo is a split housing entrance which can be identified on or off the motor. Visual inspection off the motor will be recognizable by a split in the entrance of the exhaust housing, while measurements can be taken when the turbo is installed to identify if it is a single or dual entry turbo. The question I had when first introduced to all of this is why is there so much importance and focus on the turbos when choosing an engine brake from Jacobs? CPL does matter, as well as injector timing, MVT time versus fixed time versus STC time, as well as big cam identification versus small cam identification. But the turbos seem to be the big deciding factor among the engine models. There are nine different turbos you can install on Cummins big cam, small cam motors. An HT4B, HT3B, T460, 460, 46B, excuse me, T46, T50, ST50, and a VT50, which are all single entry turbos, and the HT3B and the 4LHR for dual entry turbos. That's nine different turbos you could install in a Cummins motor. Some of these turbos were big cam or small cam specific, and if that's not confusing enough, a CPL of a 393 of a Cummins motor takes most of these turbos. I believe to understand why single entry versus dual entry turbos matters, we need to go back a few years and see who is making turbos for Cummins. Holset was manufacturing turbos for Cummins motors, and they were making them with a single entry design. Cummins motors purchased Holset in 1973, and was not until after Cummins bought Holset that the dual entry or divided entry turbo came out on the market. In the 1980s, the dual entry turbo was released into the market. Once introduced into the market, the Cummins motors started having issues such as bent push rods, cracked rocker housings, bent or broken connecting rods, and severe camshaft damage. The only differences were customers were installing the updated dual entry turbo on their trucks. How could a turbocharger cause all these issues? The answer was the difference between the amounts of boost they could provide. A dual entry turbo can build a significantly larger amount of boost at lower RPM than a single entry turbo. Turbos love being pulsed, hence why putting on an updated pulse exhaust manifold and dual entry turbo will affect your engine's performance as well as engine braking. A single entry turbo has a problem with a phenomenon called turbo reversion. This happens at lower RPMs where a dual entry turbo has the capabilities of having one, two, and three, and four, five, and six exhaust ports separated from each other by the housing having a dual entry in its housing, which counteracts this effect. Once a Cummins big cam motor reaches 
around 1800 RPM, a single entry turbo for, performs well and the exhaust reversion becomes a problem no longer. These RPMs are approximate. Single entry, single entry turbos need high RPM or a lot of pulses to start creating boost, but dual entry turbos don't need the high RPMs and are able to build boost at lower, thus at a lower RPMs with fewer pulses from the motor. So why does all this matter, and why were motors having issues? The problem was the Cummins motors were now creating too much boost when the, en <coughs> excuse me, when the engine brakes were activated. Instead of being around 10 to 13 PSI of boost while the engine brakes were activated, we were now seeing pressures as high as 30 PSI. Again, turbos love being pulsed. When operating an engine brake, the turbo is still being pulsed, which in turn is still compressing air into the combustion chamber. We want this to happen. The more volume of air we can compress or cram into the combustion chamber, the harder it is to squish that air, which in turn gives us a better engine braking by straining, by straining the engine to work and move the piston up to top dead center. The problem with a dual entry turbo is the valves couldn't physically open because too much air was being compressed into the cylinder. Remember, Jacob brakes run off the injector cam rocker, that means it runs off the injector cam profile. This contributed to why they were having so many issues when updating motors to the new turbo housing design. So what was Jacob's fix? They had a 20, 25, 25A, 25B, 25C, 30, 30E, 44E, and 44B models out on the market. The fix was a new model of engine brake made by Jacobs, but more importantly, they released the auto lash screw, not to be confused with the reset screw used on a 401A, 401B, 401C model. The auto lash screw was to be installed in place of the original adjusting screw above the slave piston on the Jacobs brake, and this cured the problem of the motors having damage done to them. Well, what is an auto lash screw and how did it fix the problem of overpressurizing the motor when the engine brakes were activated? To understand this, we need to know how an auto lash screw works. An auto lash screw was designed to change the lash adjustment when the engine brakes were energized. A typical lash adjustment was that of 18 thousandths. The auto lash screw via oil pressure would change the lash adjustment from 18 thousandths to 9 thousandths. This is an example of an auto lash screw from a Model 400. A 44E would have an auto lash screw of 23 thousandths, a Model 44B 28 thousandths, a Model 400H 28 thousandths, and a Model 400 9 thousandths protrusion when engaged. All of the stated models were adjusted to the same 18 thousandths of lash between the valve bridge and the slave piston. The ability to change the lash adjustment when the engine brakes were activated was simply to advance the exhaust valve opening. By advancing the valve opening on the exhaust valve, Jacobs was shortening the time the cylinder could build pressure. Open the valve sooner and you give less time to build the pressure in the cylinder. As stated before, a 44B model had an auto lash screw that would protrude 28 thousandths. And per Jacobs installation and adjustment manual, Jacobs has the valve lash set at 18 thousandths. This means that when the engine brakes were activated, the auto lash screw would push the slave piston down, engaging the exhaust valves and then seating them 10 thousandths at all times as the motor brakes. This would allow a bleed off effect so the cylinder would operate in safe operating ranges. Then the master piston via the injector rocker through hydraulic force would act upon the slave piston, moving the exhaust valve down further for its full travel, then returning the exhaust valves to a 10 thousandths unseated position. Once the engine brakes were turned off, the oil pressure would fall in the engine brake housing and the auto lash screw would retract, allowing the slave piston to return to its 18 thousandths lash setting. Picking the right model, auto lash screw, and knowing this, what style of turbo is critical for not only effective engine braking but without having any engine damage. Mismatching, mismatching auto lash screws with engine brakes would cause an incorrect valve opening event which in turn could cause extreme engine failure or poor engine braking as well. Before the 420, 425, and 425A Jacobs models were released, Jacobs brake released the 401A, 401B, and 401C models. 
These models were the same in operational theory, but they used a different valve train components. The main components that differed were the valve bridges for the exhaust valves, slave pistons, and the use of reset screws. For the slave piston adjustment, oh, reset screws for the slave piston adjustment. The 401 models, when actuated, would only engage one of the two exhaust valves. Jacobs called this a single valve principle versus the two valve principle. The 25B, 30E, 400, 400H, and the 420 series operated as a two valve principle. The retrofitted exhaust bridge allowed the action of one valve being engaged while the other stayed in a fully seated position, but there are no free lunches. After every engine brake cycle, a motor still needs to cycle through its four strokes in tank compression, power, and exhaust. As the piston comes up on a compression, the injector rocker actuates the master piston. The slave piston then moves down via hydraulic force through supplied engine oil and moves the exhaust valve to the open position. The cylinder pressure is then dumped to atmosphere and now the next cycle of the engine is the exhaust cycle. This would cause one exhaust valve being open and the other closed as the engine started to begin its exhaust stroke while the Jacobs brake was completing its exhaust stroke. Having one exhaust valve open and the other closed would cause a mass amount of side load to the bridge guide and the valve bridge. To counteract this, Jacobs made what is known as a reset screw. The purpose of the reset screw was to allow the exhaust valve to return to its seated position before the exhaust rocker engaged the valve bridge for exhaust cycle. This would cancel out the side loading that would be caused by one of the valves not being seated when the exhaust rocker came to engage the bridge. An easy illustration is the reset screw removed the teeter-totter effect that would be happening between the two valves. The reset screw was also the adjusting screw that was located above the slave piston. It would be adjusted to obtain the lash required for the engine brake. Why would Jacobs only engage one valve when there are two, though? The reasoning of opening one valve instead of two was simply less strain on the valve train. With a dual entry turbo, only trying to open one valve instead of two was a lot easier while still being able to achieve high cylinder compression pressures. What were the differences between the 401A, 401B, and 401C, and why couldn't one take one model and use it in place of the other since there were no auto lash screws used in them? The slave pistons were different in diameter between the models, causing a larger or smaller hydraulic ratio. This in turn would cause the valves to be driven into the pis pistons if mismatched. The 401B did, however, take the place of the 401A and were used for big cam models running a dual entry turbo, while the 401C was manufactured for the single entry turbo. The 401B models were able to take the place of the 401A, but not the other way around. After the 401 series, the 420, 425, and 425A models came into production. 425 series models functioned as a dual valve principle design and became the universal engine brake to install on big cam and small cam motors. The difference between the 425A models that were installed on various motors was the auto lash screws. Depending upon the application with the 425A was only dependent on the correct auto lash screw being installed and adjusted to the correct lash. The Model 20 was designed for a 5 and an eighth bore NH200. The 25 series engine brakes were designed for a 5.5 inch bore small cam NH and NT motors. Both the 20 and 25 series brakes were not upgradable and are not compatible with dual entry turbos. The Model 30 was designed for a big cam 1 engine and was not upgradable but was able to convert to a DFC oil system. The Model 30 was not compatible with the dual entry turbo. The 30E was designed for Big Cam 2 engines with DFC. The early 30Es used a 3.8 slave piston adjusting screw. These housings were not upgradable. Later models of the 30E used half inch adjusting screws, and these housings could be upgraded to a 400 or 400H. When upgraded, they could be used anywhere a model 400 or 400H was specified. To upgrade a late model 30E to a 400, replace a slave piston adjusting screw to part number 3871409 auto lash and to upgrade to a 400H replace the slave piston adjusting screw to a 3871407 auto lash. 
A Model 44B was designed for an early NH and T engines. They can be upgraded to a 400 by replacing the slave piston adjusting screw to a part number 3871409 auto lash and the pressure relief master piston to a part number 3871330 master piston. To upgrade to a 400H, replace the slave piston adjusting screw to a part number 3871407 auto lash and the relief master pistons to a part number 387 330 master piston. After upgrading the 44B to a 40, 400H or 400, it can be used wherever a 400H or 400 is specified. A model 400 can be upgraded to a 400H and was designed for the NH, NT, Big Cam 2 and 3 engines. Replace the slave piston adjusting screw to a part number 3871407 auto lash. The Model 400H can be converted to a 400 by replacing the slave piston adjusting screw to a part number 3871409 auto lash. Model 401A cannot be converted and was intended for an NTC 475 twin turbo. The 401B was made for NH NT big cam motor with dual entry turbos. The use of a single entry turbo with a 401B would result in poor engine braking performance. Conversion for single entry turbos is not possible. The 401C was designed for NH NT big cam motors with single entry turbos and new big cam 4s. Use of the 401C with engines equipped with dual entry turbos will result in engine damage. Conversion of the 401C to use with a dual entry turbo is not possible. 420 and 425 can be upgraded to a 425A and were designed on pre-88, 89 small cam and big cam NH, NT engines. A 425 can be used wherever a 425A is specified without any upgrades. The 420 can be upgraded to a 425A by replacing a slave master piston with a part number 3871674 auto lash. I hope this helps those who are working on these older motors and thank you.